In this Arizona convention room are the faces of a COVID epidemic still impacting millions of Americans. I think it's the number one crisis we're facing in America right now. People suffering from post-COVID and post-vaccine symptoms and the doctors treating both patients and failures in the healthcare system. It's my belief that the, the medical system has essentially failed, it's collapsed. In a mortuary in Alabama, a growing collection of accounts of mysterious fibrous material in the systems of the dead. Can you estimate about how many other embalmers or people in the same line of work you've personally had contact with who've described something similar? Everyone that I've had personal contact with are seeing them. We report on some of the disturbing evidence and an even more disturbing lack of response. COVID has not only sickened a society, but ignited a movement among doctors who say our institutions and government kept them from curing the sick. I had seven COVID patients in the ICU and seven patients died because I wasn't allowed to treat them the way I wanted to treat them. This week, we focused on COVID, post-pandemic changes in treatment, the practice of medicine, and what's next. Welcome to a special edition of Full Measure, where we're examining post-COVID concerns and controversies. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. In recent days, Colorado Representative Lauren Boebert announced she had emergency surgery for a blood clot and was diagnosed with an iliac vein problem called Maytherner syndrome. Though it's impossible to know the root cause, we've been reporting on a notable uptick in this very disorder, as reported by independent physicians treating thousands of patients. It's one of many illnesses they say could be caused by or worsened by COVID or COVID vaccines. One estimate from a National Institutes of Health study implies up to one in four adults may be afflicted with long-term problems. Today, the latest on what cutting edge doctors are learning. Good day, she does go out for a walk. She recently did a At a recent medical conference in Phoenix, Arizona, we caught up with Dr. Vaughn, CEO of MedHelp Clinics in Birmingham, Alabama, and Dr. Pierre Corey, co-founder of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance and medical director of the Leading Edge Clinic. It's my belief that the, the medical system has essentially failed. It's collapsed. Um, it does not serve the patient. Uh, it serves numerous interests. Uh, generally, they're financial. Um, and I think it's a model where it really benefits from patients staying ill and being chronically ill. Together, doctors Vaughn and Corey have treated thousands of patients with long COVID or long vax. We met a few of them last year. Yeah, Andy Sink, 55, had a, acute COVID that required hospitalization. Phil Williams, 58, he's treating my wife for blood clotting. I have congestive heart failure as a result of it. I had GI symptoms and heart issues. Many blood clots in my lungs. According to an ongoing National Institutes of Health study, up to 25% of adults are stricken with long COVID six months after infection, which could also be long vax if they were vaccinated. Symptoms include mood problems, retina detachment, atrial fibrillation and other heart problems, blood issues, weakness, muscle disorder, nerve pain, and more. What is happening for people who may not see patterns or what's going on? One of the things I always think about the physicians that are probably in the places that aren't seeing it is that they don't have the lens to understand that there's a pathogen, a spike protein itself, causing all of these multi-systems issues. And if you don't ever have that lens, instead, you're going to basically kind of jump over yourself to try to find a way to explain these multi-systems issues that really aren't explainable previously in our textbooks, in a sense. And it's just going to be frustrating. Describe what you see happening to people. So in many ways, I mean, it is uh, very young people that were otherwise athletic and, and living their life. And then they are, go from that to being debilitated. And then on top of that, as, as Pierre said, I mean, the kind of increase in the type of cancer diagnosis that I even have in my you know, primary care practice to neurological diseases that I never thought would happen to things like systemic amyloidosis that I would have never you know, seen in some of these patients or may have seen in once in a lifetime. Dr. Corey, what are you seeing? 
I, I kind of differentiate vaccine injury and vaccine um, syndrome. The vaccine syndrome is a chronic illness. The vaccines we know can cause a lot of acute issues, so heart attacks, myocarditis, strokes, anaphylaxis, uh, various rashes, things like that. But what Jordan and I specialize in is what we call long vax. Same thing as long COVID. Only real difference is long vax is on average sicker than long COVID. Yeah. Um, I also will say the long vax is far more prevalent. So in my practice, where we've evaluated over 1,200 patients, 70% were long vax. It was triggered by the vaccine, temporally associated. And although we give it this new name, long COVID, long vax, it's not a new disease. It's an old disease that was called myalgic encephalitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME-CFS. And that disease has been around for decades, always associated with infections, but with SARS-CoV-2, the incidence of ME-CFS, or what we call long COVID, is so high. And the vaccines use the spike protein, which is the, the main pathogen on, on the virus, and that's exploded ME-CFS. What are you finding in terms of treatment in simple terms? Sometimes, if I'll address one mechanism, I can hit a home run with a patient. Like sometimes one medicine, boom, they're like, oh my God, I feel better. The vast majority, it's more iterative. I go after this one, this one, this is just my approach. And I'll find like iterative improvements. Like some symptoms will disappear when I address mast cells, others when I address anticoagulation, others when I address sort of macrophage activation. And so it's kind of like, sometimes I feel like I'm putting Humpty Dumpty together. It, it affects every system and it takes a long time to sit there and, and balance where you're going to focus. Because usually they're, they're all related in some ways, but you attack, I, at least I do, attack the thing that seems to be the most prominent first. What are you learning today that you didn't know three months ago? Like, where is this going in, in your opinion? Oh, and I think it's really the foundation of a, what we need is a new field, which is spikeopathy. We need to learn much more about that. What I'm doing, so I'm not, uh, not a basic science researcher, I'm a clinician, and I'm, up front with patients, I'm trying to learn how best to help them using various therapeutic mechanisms. Like, for instance, ivermectin, which is one of our mainstays, has about 20 positive mechanisms of action, but there's lots of other therapies which have similar. And so, really, I am just doing old good gumshoe medicine, really just figuring out how best to help my patients in a safe way, in an effective and sustained way. And, um, and that's just me trial, or, trial and erroring. And, and I have to tell you, the, the clinical trials research response of our medical system has been appalling. Cutting edge for you, what is sort of, are you on the precipice of learning the next new thing about your patients or where are you in that? A lot of what I'm seeing is addressing these people with venous disease and actually helping them get back to where they can walk upstairs, even back to running in college, those kind of things. And those things have been almost what I would call game changers. When we met Dr. Vaughn's patient, 19-year-old runner Ellen Redinger a few months back, she'd gotten very sick after getting vaccinated and getting COVID. I mean, I can pinpoint the day, the time, where I was. When I, I was running, I was doing a workout, and all of a sudden, I cannot feel my legs. I cannot feel, I mean, my heart rate is going 200. I can't do it. I call my dad, I'm like, I'm done working out. I can't, I can't do it. And I mean, I, ha I can't do any type of working out. I can go on a walk, but it has to be like a small, short walk um, for a short period of time. And if I do ever do it, I feel, all I can do the next day is lay down. Today, after months of therapies with Dr. Vaughn, Redinger reports she's back running in college again. The good news is that we are making significant progress. More and more people are learning the things that they need to learn that they're not being told. Uh, and we're figuring out every day how to help our patients. And so we're getting better at what we're doing. And I expect that trajectory to continue. The good news is, is we're learning about disease, we're learning how to treat it correctly, uh, and we're also learning how to remake our system to truly back to helping patients. Dr. Vaughn says in the past year he's diagnosed 125 patients with iliac vein disorder or May Thurner syndrome. Prior to that, he says he'd never seen a case. Ahead on Full Measure are reports of mysterious blood clots turning up in cadavers true. For whatever reason, America's health officials haven't seemed publicly interested in answering a crucial question. How many illnesses and deaths can be attributed to COVID versus the vaccines or some combination? 
Today we look at shocking and graphic evidence that independent researchers are trying to make sense of in the absence of helpful guidance from the usual authorities. A mysterious fibrous material being discovered in the veins and arteries of the dead. A caution, some of the images in our report are graphic. These vials are basically samples of the white fibrous material that I've been discussing. Richard Hirschman is an embalmer who's been investigating disturbing evidence left by the dead. Mysterious clots appearing in cadavers around the world. Well, the very first photograph I took was in September of 2021. What does that first photograph show? That first photograph shows a very, very large uh, white fibrous looking clot that was literally about the length of the individual's leg itself. Clots are one of the things we run into sometimes in embalming. We're, we're used to that, but these clots are totally different. Oh no, there it is. To his surprise, the strange, long, fibrous clots started turning up in more and more bodies that Hirschman examined, all of them after COVID and the vaccines hit the market. What types of people are you getting these clots from? Yes, that's a great question because the majority of the ones that I'm seeing a lot of these clots in are older people. But it doesn't mean it's exclusive to the older people. The first person that I took a picture of was only in their mid-50s. So it's not, it's not necessarily grandma or grandpa. And I've seen them in people as young as 20. So it seems it's worse in the elderly, but it's not exclusive to the elderly. Hirschman wasn't alone in his observations. He began connecting with embalmers and funeral directors in Canada, the UK, and New Zealand who were reporting the same disturbing phenomenon. So it's six inches, 15, 15, 16 centimeters. Uh, white fibrous clots that have been supplied by embalmers, uh, and they're seeing these all around the world. These long strands coming out of the blood vessels. These have been taken directly from the circulatory system. Can you estimate about how many other embalmers or people in the same line of work you've personally had contact with who've described something similar? Everyone that I've had personal contact with are seeing them. Why is this so remarkable in your opinion? The most remarkable thing that the blood has changed that I've I'm I obvious I can see the most alarming is this white fibrous structure, this, this material that looks, it, it's, it's hard to describe. It almost looks like, a, um, it almost looks like calamari or like spaghetti or, you know, some kind of a, it, it's not blood. It's not blood. All of the people that I've spoken to, and I know about four of them that have over 50 years of experience, had never seen these things until recently. Though some embalmers say they tried reporting to their official professional bodies, they say nobody in government or public health seem interested in tracking and getting to the bottom of it. Former Air Force Major Tom Haviland became interested and started attempting to document and quantify the cases. Tell me a little bit more about the information you've tried to gather and what you learned. So I decided to do a survey it started out to be a nationwide survey in the United States, and I expanded it to Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand, and asked basic questions. We asked embalmers, um, what are you seeing? Are you seeing these white fibrous clots? When did you start seeing them? Where are you finding them on the body? And then how much and what percentage of your corpses are you seeing these white fibrous clots? Haviland surveyed over 200 embalmers he says 73% reported seeing the white fibrous clots. They reported seeing them in about one in five corpses in 2023. None reported seeing any such anomalies prior to the COVID pandemic and the beginning of mass vaccinations. Have you ever been able to learn whether there are any governments or any public information bodies that are collecting this data and interested in trying to figure out what it means? I submitted my uh, results to the FDA for their uh, vaccine and related biological products advisory committee meeting. And I've heard nothing, Cheryl, from the FDA about it since then. What kind of pushback are you getting or have you gotten? And how would you answer the criticisms? Yes, some of the criticisms, people think that uh, what I have done is unethical, that I shouldn't share the stuff that I see in this embalming room. And on one hand, 
I sometimes I see their point because what happens in here is, is, is kind of private and it's personal. However, at the same time, if I'm seeing something that may be affecting a whole lot of people and humanity might be at stake, by saying nothing is unethical. It's eating at my soul to leave it quiet because many, many lives may be at stake. And no matter what's causing this, whether it's the virus, the vaccine, or whether it's you know, uh, Cheerios or, you know, a bad box of Cracker Jacks. Something has to be found out what's causing it because it's obviously a change in the blood. The FDA did offer a response to full measure stating, quote, the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control place a high priority on vaccine safety and are committed to our vaccine safety monitoring program. The FDA has not identified any safety signals for fibrous blood clots with COVID-19 vaccines. They also stated that since the observations were made on cadavers, quote, it falls outside of the FDA's regulatory purview. Coming up, inside a new movement of physicians breaking away from established medicine after COVID. The COVID experience ignited a movement within mainstream medicine among doctors who say their institutions or the government barred them from helping their patients. Hundreds of like-minded medical professionals recently gathered in Phoenix, Arizona for a third annual conference where they aren't just tackling COVID and vaccine injuries, they're aiming to take the lead on many of America's unaddressed health emergencies. Dr. Paul Merrick was a professor of medicine and chair of pulmonary and critical care medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School and a doctor at Centara Norfolk General Hospital, world renowned as one of the most published critical care physicians. But when COVID hit, it changed the course of his career. If we had adopted, as a number of countries have done, early, widespread, early treatment, we could have controlled and ended this pandemic in the middle of 2020. For the first time, Dr. Merrick says, he wasn't allowed to treat his patients as he saw fit. The short version is that we developed a, or I developed a protocol for the treatment of the hospitalized patients with COVID went against the narrative of the National Institute of Health and whatever. And so my results were at least twice as good as everyone else's result. But I was, I was using off-label drugs and I wasn't following the narrative. So um, they stopped me, they actually stopped me, prohibited me treating my patients the way I wanted to treat my patients. Who's they? They was uh, the healthcare system, which was Centaur Healthcare System. In, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. And so it put me in a difficult position. What, you know, what was I to do? So my lawyer said, well, just go to work and just document what happened. So the following week I went to work, I had seven COVID patients in the ICU and seven patients died because I wasn't allowed to treat them the way I wanted to treat them, which is, which is my right as a treating physician. Dr. Merrick sued his employer, Centara Healthcare, but ended up quitting his job and dropping the lawsuit in early 2022. What was the easy version, the main difference between what they wanted you to do and what you wanted to do? Yeah, so they basically outlawed all the drugs that I was using. I was, uh, you know, I was using corticosteroids, vitamin C, um, a whole bunch of other drugs. Um, the ivermectin, they wouldn't allow me from the beginning. And basically I was forced to use remdesivir which we know is a toxic drug, and so I refused. So basically, I couldn't treat my patients. Dr. Merrick turned his full attention to a group he helped launch, Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, or FLCCC. So this organization today, its purpose is what? We develop protocols for the early treatment of COVID. So that was our initial focus, but you know, COVID shone a, light, a very bright light on the corruption of the system, uh, how the system is controlled by Big Pharma. So I then developed a protocol for the treatment of diabetes. Um, partly it was self-motivated because I was a type 2 diabetic. And so the traditional 
narrative is that diabetes is a progressive disease, it's treated with medication, you're going to get complications, you're going to lose your legs, etc., etc. And that, that's a false narrative. And so diabetes is a treatable disease with lifestyle changes as well as other interventions. So that's what I did and I know I'm no longer a type 2 diabetic. And so that's really what we're now focusing on. Well, you know, we still, COVID is still a big problem and the vaccine injured is a very big problem. But, you know, our focus now is on patient empowerment in, you know, empowering patients to take charge of their own health. FLCCC conferences have attracted larger crowds each year. February's meeting in Phoenix was the third. I think it's the number one crisis we're facing in America right now because of what this spike protein and vaccine injuries can cause. It leads to so many other diseases and illnesses. I think it's the number one th thing we're facing in America right now. I was in a um, physician-owned practice and they wouldn't let me treat COVID. So the short version is I quit. I started my own direct primary care practice. So. Um, now I can dispense ivermectin, I treat long COVID, I treat vaccine injuries, uh, and I can take care of my patients. There will be more viruses and diseases and outbreaks. What do you see happening in the near future? I think th there's no question of doubt that the current health care system has failed. And so we need an alternative. And so, you know, we one of many organizations that I think can provide a, a solution. Uh, an answer to this ongoing failure of the healthcare system. Dr. Merrick and his group have come under brutal attacks from some pharmaceutical allies. Recently, Dr. Allison Neitzel of the group Misinformation Kills issued a lengthy apology for her own misinformation about Dr. Merrick and FLCCC. She noted flaws in her criticisms about, about their studies and says she regrets using words like fraudulent and grift. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, the shocking destruction of a major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, brought big pledges of assistance from President Biden regarding what the federal government will do. We set off to Ohio to find out what became of all the promises made to East Palestine residents more than a year ago after a toxic train derailment devastated the town. It's hard. There's conflicting information. Um, there's still neighbors that aren't home and that have said that their homes are tested back, you know, contaminated. Promises kept or broken next week on Full Measure. In the meantime, you can hear more stories on our podcast, Full Measure After Hours, wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Ackeson.